Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York, a lifelong love affair with radio. For this kid from Corning, New York, it began at age 10 when he built his own crystal set at home. From there, he built a career that took him to the red carpet at the Oscars, interviewing stars for the ABC radio network. His name is Bill Deal. You'll meet him next. So, Bill Deal, welcome to the program. It's a delight to have you here. And this extraordinary career of yours, I'm, I'm just charmed by the fact that uh, you began it as an outlaw. <laughs> well, that happened when I bought a, uh, I think it was called a wireless microphone from mm. a company out in Chicago. And it had a little antenna that hung down from it. And uh, I suddenly realized when I got it, I could broadcast around our house to different frequencies in a radio, right? That because you had built this crystal set. Yeah, well, I knew I had headphones and I knew, what, <laughs> I knew what that was about. So here I am with this, uh, with this little thing and my mother could hear me in the kitchen and I'm <laughs> reading newscasts, I'm doing all kinds of stuff, playing music through the thing. And then we had a big shortwave antenna in the backyard that went from the house to the garage. And I said, I wonder what would happen if I took this little antenna and hooked it up to the big antenna. <laughs> My yes. God, I was broadcasting for six blocks in the neighborhood. You were, I you had were my, a star at I, 10. Yeah, I had my own little program schedule and I am uh, playing music, but I'd pull the thing up to a record player or something. And so I had a program schedule. I told neighbors where you could hear me <laughs> at 1350 on the AM dial, right? Well, this was going on for a few weeks. I, I would take the, the thing out on the street. I interviewed a bus driver with a thing. Wow. I'm, I'm now a broadcaster. <laughs> and uh, then one day, there's a knock at the door, and my father answered. And it's a guy who lived across the street. He was a short wave operator, a ham operator. Uh-huh, yeah. He said, Mr. Deal, he said, is there a radio station uh, here operating? My dad said, well, my son has this little thing, you know, going on. He said, he could be in trouble and arrested by the Federal Communications Commission. My dad, who was very serious about everything, said, shut that thing down. <laughs> <laughs> you were violating FCC regulations yes, at I, 10 years old. Yeah, good, I was a pirate radio guy. Good for you. <laughs> well, that was the beginning of just a tremendous career. Uh, you, you grew up in Corning, so later you were working for the Cor uh, Corning radio station, WCLI. Right. You went to Ithaca College, worked on the radio station at the college, then got a job at a commercial station in Ithaca, and you told me a great story about... Uh, they were very aggressive about selling uh, ads on that station. Oh, yeah. Well, we had a, a, a little, remember the Izetta? It was a little car with uh, yes. three wheels. Three wheels, right? one in the front. And so uh, the station manager painted it Mobile Unit 2, right? <laughs> there was no number one, but they would drive around <laughs> Ithaca with this thing, WTKO Mobile Unit. Two, Mobile but, Unit 2. Yeah, right. right. So then one day, the station program director came in with this little radio. I said, what's that? He said, this is a fire radio. We want you to listen, and whenever there is a fire going on in town, we want you to interrupt programming and announce it that there's a fire on South Cayuga Street. No. I said, really? He said, yes, he said. And then he said, here's what we want you to say. When the fire bell rings and the siren wails, tune to TKO for all the details. Oh, my God. Now, that sounds, oh, that sounds pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> this, this fire report has been brought to you by the McKinney Insurance Agency. For of all course, of course, they sold it. He, they, yes. I've worked a little bit in radio. I mean, you've had a, right. you know, a, an eternal career. I've worked <laughs> a little bit in radio. And they'll sell everything. If they have a chance to say, you know, 
uh, I'm wearing, you know, <laughs> Tom McCann shoes. They're going to figure out a way to say, our, all our DJs wear Tom, and you should too, and this, this part of the program is brought to you. I mean, they sell everything. Yeah. But this was outrageous. This was. So anyway, we, we started doing this, and the phone rings, and it's the fire chief, the fire commissioner. He said, you can't do this. This is in Ithaca. This, this is in Ithaca. We've put the thing on the air that there's a fire, and they aren't even there yet. <laughs> well, obviously, <laughs> we, were in, we were in trouble. Yeah. So we had to stop it. Yeah. But that's the kind of stuff that went on. You mentioned about selling stuff so quickly. Uh, I was in the studio manning the control board during a high school football game, and the uh, salesman calls me. He says, Bill, we just sold the second half. <laughs> he said, I'll, I'll read you the commercial, and I'd type it down. I mean, that was, the, that was local. There are, there are so many wonderful stories uh, it, 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 backstage of radio. And we're going to get to a couple of them in a yeah. minute. But I want to get you to uh, of an important station in your career, WNEW. In this town, 1130 on the dial, it was a marvelous radio station. It bills itself, or used to, as the greatest radio station in the world, and I think it was. As a kid, I listened to NEW, I learned from NEW, imagine that, learning from a music radio station because the personalities, Willie B and uh, Jim Lowe and all Ted the rest. Brown, were, yep. Ed Brown, Ted Brown, they were so urbane, they were so knowledgeable about the music, and I got a music education, but I also had got a dream from that station, I thought, I can, I can do this. I'm going to be Will, Willie B. Williams. <laughs> well, well, what was your yeah, experience right. at any double? <laughs> Nobody was quite like him. Uh, I, uh, I got to WNEW via Washington, D.C., worked there for a short time yeah. at WTOP, the big CBS station. I even worked for Maury Povich for a short time. Remember him? Yes. Uh, he's still around. I think he's retiring now. Uh, I worked with his wife, Connie Chung. Yeah, all right. So anyway, I got uh, an offer to go to WNEW when I'm at WTOP. And I, like you, always wanted to work for a station like that. So early 67, there I am on the overnight newscasts. The Milkman's Matinee. Milkman's Matinee with a guy named Dick Shepard. And, but here I am, this is a 30-man news department. This is a monster. I say man because there were hardly any women there except, right. uh, you know, desk assistants and things like that. Right. But, but, but here I am, and it was, it was fabulous. The station is 50,000 watts up and down the East Coast. coast. Uh, well, this was extraordinary news yeah. department. I mean, Dave Marish worked there, came out of that station. Uh, Ed Colin, you can go on. Jack Lawrence, yeah. yeah, a lot of, lot of, a lot of guys who went. Reed Chris Collins Glenn, yeah. went to the, went to the networks yeah. afterwards. But that was an, it's the re, without getting into, right. you know, all the details. WNEW is the reason I'm sitting here today. Oh, anyway, go gosh. on. <laughs> uh, I saved a lot of the old uh, memos uh, from the station because yeah. they started their own independent news department, I think, in 1958. Right. Uh, and the reason was the news was coming from the Daily News before that. <laughs> they were writing the news. Just stealing it out of the paper. And they had these big, ballsy announcers, you know, reading newscasts and so forth. But these guys who were now doing news were what's called reader-writers. So we were writing our own newscasts and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, there was a news director, and I think I've mentioned his name, uh, Lee Who? Hanna? Lee Hanna, right. I, and, I met him later when he was a TV executive. Yeah. And he, uh, I read one of the old memos about uh, Jackie Wilson, rock and roll singer, critically injured by uh, shots from a f female admirer, woman admirer. Shot him six times. Six times. <laughs> Uh, Hannah was uh, not very happy, and so he wrote in the memo, if she had <laughs> admired him any more, she would have killed him. <laughs> so it, it was that kind of, of thing. But, you know, 
Everybody wanted to do great lead lines in newscasts. Oh, of course. WNEW was famous for it. Mort Krim was a newscaster. Ah, there. yes. Yeah, yeah. The Copacabana nightclub was then having a big dust up with their uh, dancer stars. There was only one bathroom for them. The, so, the women who danced at the Cobra. Yeah. So <laughs> Mort Krim decides, I've, I've got to come up with a good line for this. So he said, who put all those great looking tomatoes in that little can? <laughs> now, the, well, it, very good, very clever for it, 1968 right. or something. These, Wouldn't go so well today. These days, you might be fired for saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was saying earlier, and, and we started to touch on it, there are so many great behind the scenes stories, pranks, uh, practical jokes that announcers play on each other or newsmen. I was once watched. I once watched in a station in Worcester, Massachusetts. I once watched the newscaster who's reading the news off a roll of you know coming off the, uh, the wire machine. He's got the roll. He's just reading. He's not. He didn't write it. He's yep. reading it right off the roll. And of course, the bottom of the roll is hanging down. Somebody sneaks into the studio while he's on the air and sets fire to the bottom <laughs> of the roll. I mean, so yeah. Uh, one, one other little story, I'm doing the overnight on WNEW, and one of the desk assistants thought he'd be funny. And so he slipped into my newscast a, a late word just in. I started to read it. A large gorilla is crawling up the Empire State Building. <laughs> I suddenly stopped and realized that it was somebody was playing a little joke on me. But the, the desk assistant was told the next day, don't you dare do that again. Right. I but mean, yeah, there were all kinds of things. Yeah. But we have, we have an example of a just exquisite <laughs> prank that was played on, I'm not going to mention his name yet, that was played on a huge radio television personality and uh, who liked to sing. Be, be in the studio be, while he was waiting to be recorded for his show. Listen to this. For once in my life, I've found someone who needs me. Someone who knows how to care. That, Bill, is awful. <laughs> it, is no, it is no surprise why that guy did ne never won a Grammy. Who was that? Howard Cosell. <laughs> Howard Cosell. There was no one quite like him. And you're right about uh, he did not know this was being recorded, but engineers loved to record him before he started his broadcast. He, re he would do it either from his home, sometimes in the right. studio, but most often they would get these great little snippets from Howard. Sure, he but, did yeah, it all the time. Yeah. And uh, Dan Ingram was a disc jockey at WABC. And so the engineers would send that tape down to Dan Ingram so he could introduce Howard with all kinds of interesting things like, how are you doing today, Howard? And you would hear Cosell say, well, I just don't know. This is only radio. I don't know if I can do another show. I mean, they play that back. To put a bow on the story, the engineers used to slip those tapes to Ingram in the afternoon, I think he was, Dan Ingram, and a very popular guy. And he made, you, he made, he made a comedy bits out of them. And uh, let's play one. The most music on WABC New York. What is he doing in here? You're not, you're not going to sing again, are you? Bum, 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 no, no. Bum, no, bum, no, bum, no, bum. Howard, Howard. The whole world smiles at me. Bum, Howard, thank you, Howard. What's up? No, it sounds very bad, Howard. That's what's the matter Does with it. Does it sound better? No, it sounds bad. I said, not better. Well, it doesn't get any better than <laughs> Nothing that. Nothing like did, old, did, old air checks. Well, yeah. What did Cosell think when he found out this had been happening to him? Or well, did he ever find out? He did, uh, because his wife, uh, Emmy, you know, his, sure. his lovely wife, she found out once that they had recorded something when Howard was having a little fight with her. They were yelling at each other or something. She heard about it. She came over to the network and went to the engineer and shouted at him, don't you ever do that again? <laughs> Memo, of course, went out. 
No more taping of Howard. Right. It was so great for a while, though. Yeah, it was. Yeah. There are, there are so many of those don't ever memos. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do this. Oh, yeah. Because there were a million things that were going on, yeah. pranks and... No, I interviewed Howard for a, one of his books. Uh, I think you may even have a picture of me with him somewhere uh, interviewing him for the book. And I asked him, and I asked this of a lot of people about uh, regrets and, uh, and so forth. Did you make your mark uh, in anything great? Uh, Hugh Hefner of Playboy, I asked him. He says, yeah, I think I made a mark somehow. He said, but I had a hell of a nice time doing it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so I asked that of Cosell. And he almost shouted at me. He said, how can you ask me a question like that, Bill Deal? Of course I've made a mark. I am, you know, a great, great broadcaster like nobody else. No one will ever be like me. <laughs> Sports journalism is dead. Oh. Oh, yeah. I, I, Howard may have killed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill Deal had a, what, 50-year career on the ABC radio network? I can't believe it. I really can't. Uh, Interviewing and, and I'm, everyone. I'm still there officially because a lot of old obits of big stars are now airing when they're passing away. Yeah, you've, you, do, you did obit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Bill interviewed everybody from Alan Alda to Yoko Ono. Uh, let's get to some of those interviews. Um, <laughs> Tom Hanks, when he was a young guy, you yeah. got him and, and yeah. he talked to you his, about his first movie. And I asked him, I said, what was the first movie you ever did? And he said, well, it was done on Staten Island. It was called A, a Knife Rack Movie. Uh, <laughs> the title of the movie was He, he Knows You're Alone. Mm. Yeah, and, what's right? a, and he explained what a knife rack movie is? Yeah. Uh, a woman is in the kitchen and there's a knife rack nearby. One of the knives is empty. It's, it's not missing. there. It's missing, yeah. It's missing. He was paid, I think, uh, about uh, $800 yeah. to do the movie. Yeah. And it was on Staten Island. And there he is as a big star later on. <laughs> yeah. Look, <laughs> look for it. I don't think you'll find it on Netflix. He knows you're alone. He knows you're Tom alone. Tom Hanks. Yep. And I love what you told him. You said, uh, Tom, you look like the boy next door. And what it <laughs> yeah. But if the boy next door happens to be Ted Bundy, <laughs> yeah. I hope your, your viewers know who Ted Bundy was, but he was a pretty big, yeah, awful we, killer. We know who Ted Bundy yeah, was. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, Jane Fonda, very poignant interview you did with Jane Fonda. On, I guess it was when, I don't know if it was when On Golden Pond came out or it was a great much of the subject of your- I interviewed her a couple of times, yeah. Yeah, and, but, and that was a very you know, father-daughter yeah, thing going was, on in that movie. It was very poignant. And she said to me, you know, she said, uh, my father and I resolved our differences early on but there are things that I could never tell him until we did this movie. And so she said, I'm actually saying things that he had never heard me say. And she said it was very emotional. Interesting, uh, her candor that she would refer to their real life. And, and, and the, I, I don't want to say that she was estranged from him, but they, had a, they apparently had a very difficult relationship, yeah. with father and daughter. Yeah. And, here it is, and here's this movie years later that, where she's working it out on the screen yeah. with him. She, I did ask, and I asked a lot of celebrities sometimes this question. Uh, uh, it was, do you have any regrets? Mm. And so she said uh, very candidly, she says, I will regret till the day I die that photograph of me sitting on an anti-aircraft uh, gun in North Vietnam. Yeah. It, it, of course, made her Hanoi Jane. Harry Belafonte, uh, what an extraordinary man and talent, but extraordinary man. 85 years old when he came into our studio. And he was a, like a celebrity to a lot of young people. A lot of young interns were in our studio. They won pictures with this man. He was so sweet, so nice. And I started talking to him about the great uh, records that he had done. And Calypso was one of them. Mm, the but, album. But here's something I didn't know 
uh, it was four minutes short. And when he when he finished the when album, record, doing the recording, it was and, they still needed another four minutes yeah, to right. complete the album. So he said, "Well, I've done this song." He says that uh, I started. He says, "I think he's mentioned from Jamaica, and it was uh, the Banana Boat song." Day O, right? <laughs> Day -o. He, he said it became so popular, and I was so well known for it that when I did confession. The priest started doing Deo in the middle of the really? confessional. Priests it, would in the confessional? Yeah. yeah. They, they recognized his voice he or they could see him or something. Knew exactly who he was. And they're, they're doing Deo back yeah, then? Wouldn't you love to hear that one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no penance, sir. Uh, you, you, you stole 47 cars from the. But don't worry, just sing Deo for me. Yeah. Because I'm going to sing it to you. <laughs> you make me happy. <laughs> I got to ask you to talk a little about Jack Lemon, one of my favorite actors. Yeah. Jack Lemon, uh, uh, I've always adored him, you know, and he's done so many great movies. Uh, but one was interesting about his name. Harry Cohn was the big guy, you know, with Columbia, Columbia Pictures. Pictures. Yeah, he was the and boss. Wanted Jack to change his name. He didn't like he, Lemon. He didn't like Lemon. He said, you know, he says, if you keep that name, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to say, this movie's a lemon. Uh, you've got to change it to something else. Well, well what am I going to change it to? Uh, change it to Lennon. Lennon. L-E-N-N-O-N. -N -N. Right, Jack. Yeah, and, but, and, and Jack said, but Mr. Cohn, you know, I'm going to sound like a Russian revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> Lenin. Very, very clever answer by Jack. Yeah. I don't think, but, how, I don't think uh, Cohn uh, knew his, uh, yeah. wasn't thinking about uh, world history when he yeah, made that suggestion. Happen. Yeah, what could happen, yeah. You know, your books uh, are full of, you know, we have 50 years of interviews. <laughs> Uh, who else comes to mind? Who else you want to talk about? Uh, I always wanted to interview Doris Day, but I never got to do it. Really? Uh, I messaged her, sent messages uh, to her manager. Once my wife and I were driving up the West Coast. She lived in Carmel, as you may know. And uh, her manager said, Bill, we'd love to have you there, but uh, just isn't going to happen. She's just not doing interviews anymore. Yeah. Now, this was in the 1980s, but she had, was out of the business. I, she did a television show for a while, as you may know, but uh, she just didn't do any interviews. All she wanted was her animals. Mm. And when she died, almost, uh, you know, made it to 100, there, there we are, you know. Do you ever interview, speaking of famous female stars who make it, or almost make it to 100. Did you ever, any, ever interview Betty White? Never got to Betty White. I did do Dolly Parton. Ah. And <laughs> uh, uh, Johnny Carson. She's still, Donny, Dolly's still going. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She, she's, a, I, I don't know how old she is, but she's old. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, I pulled a great clip that I had seen from Johnny Carson. And uh, I think that he once said to her, he said, he was talking about her ample bosom. Yes. And he said, you know, he said, I'd give a year's salary to see what's under that. Mm. And so I, I said to Do I reminded Dolly Parton about that. And she said, uh, Bill, those are my two best assets. She was always very frank about how she looked. I mean, she, she used enormous amounts of makeup and the hair and the whole thing. Oh, yeah. And she just owned up to it and said, listen, you know, this is how I, I present myself, and uh, I hope people will accept because the music's good. Yeah. I once met her at a, in a green room at, at, at NMEC, and I was startled by how tiny and and frail and she look if it she looked i don't think she's more than five foot two or something and she is so she looked like chinese porcelain that if you touched her to her she'd crack and just fall apart yeah yeah judy garland uh died in 1969 i believe and uh i never interviewed her uh, but uh my wife and i went to the funeral it was the campbell's funeral home yeah uh up on madison avenue and it was an open casket. 
Whoa. I have never seen anyone looking so frail. You talked about, you know, someone like that who you always admired and she looked bigger than life on stage. You know, she was small though, but I've never seen anything so, so frail. I got to do her obit, as a matter of fact, when I was at WNEW. NEW had a great music library. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I got, what I, earlier, I mean, I, they played Ellington, they played Basie, they played Harry James, uh, Sarah Vaughan. The big stars would come in for interviews. Yeah. My first night there on the overnight, Tony Bennett walked in. Well, uh, which way is the studio, right? Yeah. Steve Lawrence, Edie Gourmet. Well, this man was on the red carpet uh, at the Oscars for all those years for ABC Radio. You'll still hear his voice now and then because uh, he's about 40 or 50 obits in the can over there at ABC <laughs> Radio. Bill Deal, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's been a great ride, uh, a dream that I never expected, I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good for you. <laughs> And thank you for watching, uh, folks. Next week, we're going to be here with a program about a very important building in uh, Lower Manhattan on Fifth Avenue that is uh, landmarked. And it opens up a story of uh, 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 an effort to landmark a whole, much, whole bigger area of Greenwich Village. So be with us next week for that. Thanks for watching.